Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Democrats Abroad Student Loan Debt Relief webinar. Uh, my name is Rebecca Lammers. I am the chair of the Democrats Abroad Global Taxation Task Force. I'm really excited to be able to welcome everyone attending this special event today. Um, just a reminder that this event is being recorded and it will be shared on social media afterwards. So everybody here attending will get an email follow up with the slides, uh, as well as a recording and information with the links for, uh, that are referenced throughout the webinar. So uh, again, my name is Rebecca Lammers. I am the Democrats Abroad Global Chair for the Taxation Task Force, and I live in London and I vote in Ohio. Uh, the Democrats Abroad um, uh, are able to present this webinar today uh, in uh, co-hosting with the Global Youth Caucus as well as the Global Progressive Caucus. Um, on August 24th, President Biden forgave between $10,000 and $20,000 in federal student loans for anyone that makes less than $125,000. So on this webinar, we're gonna be talking about that federal student loan forgiveness that's available to Americans abroad, how it came about and how you can ac get access to that relief. So with that, I'm going to um, read our disclaimer. Uh, Brett, if you could go to the next slide. Um, so I'm sorry I have to read this, but I'll read it quickly. Democrats abroad cannot provide individual tax advice. Advice requires consideration of your individual circumstances and needs, none of which can be done at this event. We are not tax lawyers, accountants, or advisors. Please consult the professional tax advisor, accountant, return preparer when addressing your personal tax matters. Democrats abroad does not endorse or recommend companies or individuals attending or hosting this event. The views expressed at the event are those of the respective individuals and companies, not Democrats abroad. No liability is accepted by Democrats abroad for the opinions expressed or for any errors or admissions expressed about matters of tax in any country, your financial planning, or your legal obligations. If you are in need of tax advice, you can consult the American Citizens Abroad Tax Return Preparer Directory to find an advisor or tax return preparer near you or providing online services to meet your needs and budget, though buyers need always beware. Um, so uh, if you go to the next slide, um, you'll be able to see our, our agenda for this event. And uh, with that, I am actually going to go ahead and toss it over to Candace, uh, the chair of Democrats Abroad. So Candace, take it away. Hey there, thank you, Rebecca, uh, and welcome everyone. Hope you can hear me. Uh, welcome everyone to today's call. I did just wanna start by giving a huge thank you to Rebecca Lammers, uh, chair of Democrats Abroad's Taxation Task Force. Uh, as well as everyone who is playing a very active role on that team. A thank you to everyone behind the scenes helping with moderation and everything today as well. And of course, a thank you to Nigla for coming and speaking to Democrats Abroad. I wanted to zoom out a little bit uh, and it's fantastic to see so many people on today's call from so many different parts of the world uh, and just say a few words about what Democrats Abroad is. Uh, so within the Democratic Party, there are 57 what are called state parties. So one for each state, one for DC, Puerto Rico, and then for each of the US territories. And then there's Democrats abroad. We have official recognition within the Democratic Party and our role within the larger ecosystem is to make sure that the 6.5 million US citizens who are eligible to vote and who are living abroad do cast a ballot in this year's midterm elections. The votes from abroad that came in in 2020 were very decisive. They confirmed Biden's win in not only Georgia, but in Arizona as well. So if overseas voters like yourselves had not showed up in 2020, we would very, very likely be looking at a completely different landscape in the United States. We've already seen so many great steps forward for our country under President Biden's leadership. The reason we're here today was student uh, loan relief uh, was a campaign promise made by President Biden and one that he has followed through on. Uh, we just saw the passage of the Inflation Reduction, Reduction Act as well. That's the largest investment that the United States has ever made in combating climate change. We also see again on a variety of issues, protecting a woman's right to choose, acting on climate, acting on gun safety laws, the list goes on. And the point that I'd really like to bring home today is if you care about these issues, 
please vote this November. There is so much at stake and everything that I just listed from the Inflation Reduction Act to the action that President Biden has taken on student loans to confirming bodily autonomy, marriage equality, access to contraception, the list goes on. Not a single Republican has voted in favor of this. So please keep that in mind. Please know again that there are 435 seats. Every single US Senator is up for reelection. That means that if you have a US passport, you have at least one important race to be voting for this November. We at Democrats Abroad are here to help. We have a website, votefromabroad.org, where you can both register to vote and request your absentee ballot. Uh, please head over to Vote From Abroad if you haven't done so already. Again, so much is at stake. And as an overseas voter, it's good to take care of this early. You can already request your ballot. Uh, and everyone who has requested their ballot uh, in 2022 should receive it on September 24th. Uh, that's Saturday, September 24th. Uh, that is the day under federal law that local election officials are required to send ballots to overseas voters, but only if you've requested it in 2022. So especially if you're voting in one of the battleground states, Wisconsin, Georgia, Ohio, Pennsylvania, uh, Arizona, it's early to get, the, it's better to get this done early, make sure that everything is squared away. I know we had a lot of Iowa voters popping up in the chat. There was a congressional district in Iowa that was lost in 2020 by six votes, six votes. So every single vote is gonna count. We see again, narrower and narrower margins. And that's where Democrats abroad comes in. That's where your vote comes in as an overseas voter. So head over to votefromabroad.org and please know, again, we have made so much progress with student uh, loan debt relief. I know as a younger person, there have been so many people uh, affected by this, plagued by this, I would even go as far to say. And again, when it comes down to who is acting on this, the choice could not be clearer between Democrats and Republicans. So we need to grow our majorities in Washington so that President Biden can keep leading the way forward. Uh, and we need to grow our majorities in state legislatures and governorships around the country. So votefromabroad.org. Again, if you have any questions, Democrats Abroad has a fantastic volunteer team ready to help. Um, and I will just end by saying, if you hit any snags in the process, please do not give up. Uh, if you have a US passport, you can vote in the November 8th midterm elections. Do not let anyone tell you otherwise. And if you hit any roadblocks, please come see us. Again, we have a great team who's ready to help. So votefromabroad.org. Uh, and I think we're gonna post just a little brief text in the, uh, in the chat, if it hasn't been posted already. If you could please just share the message about voting from abroad on your social media and your networks uh, at your workplace, uh, whoever else you know who's voting from abroad or who is living abroad, make sure they're voting. Uh, so much is at stake and it's really imperative that we keep uh, moving our country forward on so many issues, including affordable education. So with that, I'll toss it back to Rebecca. Thanks everyone for joining. Thanks so much, Candice. I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Bruce from the Progressive Caucus. Take it away, Bruce. You're on mute, Bruce. Rebecca, thanks Rebecca for allowing us to uh, participate in this great event. It's a very important issue. One of those many that uh, are on our plate as we head into the midterms. I'd like you to please go to the first slide. Oh, Brett, are you there? Oh, maybe Brett's screen is I'm still here. Can you go to the next slide? Sure. Thank All you. Right. All right. I'm not hearing Bruce, though. Thank you very much. Uh, we're calling this uh, On the Road to Affordable Higher Education. Student debt affects too many of us too severely. And we really do believe, as Candace said, that the student debt relief plan is a big step forward and that it remains necessary to address the root causes, unfair student loan practices, and the unreasonable cost of higher education. Next slide. Uh, 
as you know, uh, this crisis affects 43 million of us and the amount is $1.8 trillion. That's twice the amount of our annual defense spending. And there are too many of us who have paid the amount borrowed and still owe much more than that. From uh, student loan justice, we see that Christian in Wisconsin, for example, borrowed 74,000. He's already repaid 175,000. And because of those nagging interest rates, he owes $235,000. That is too severe. Next slide, please. We all know that uh, we have that uh, $20,000 for federal Pell Grant recipients, 10,000 in debt relief for non-Pell Grant recipients, and there are income caps. Uh, in this graph, we see that, and think about Christian, the average uh, number uh, or average amount for uh, student debt is roughly $30,000. And that means there are many more with far lower and many, many more with far higher uh, debt burdens. Next slide, please. All right, there is a proposal uh, that helps for current and future borrowing. And we really help that that proposal turns into a plan that is enacted to uh, maximize the amount of discretionary income at 5% monthly for undergraduate loans, raise the non-discretionary income amount, protect it from repayment, for giving balances of $12,000 or less after 10 years of payments, and covering the borrower's unpaid monthly interest. That monthly interest is a real killer. And we must continue to strive for tuition-free higher education. There are challenges that exist, and so too do innovative approaches continue to uh, develop. Uh, I put the link for this presentation in our chat box, and you'll see that there are links in the presentation that take you to further information, including an online form uh, that you can find uh, at the top of our presentation, which will be published in October and provide information about what you can do right now to get the help that uh, is being promised. Last slide, please. Uh, I also want to uh, mention that uh, we would like it very much if you would join CODA, because like Candace, we believe we must hold the House and increase our Senate majority. And we believe we can do that also with progressive candidates. And if you do, we can make progress in 2023 and beyond on expanding Medicare, lowering uh, the cost of higher education, and making sure that we get to 50% CO2 reduction by 2030, and a whole slew of other things, including uh, the pro-labor, pro-act passage, passing the John Lewis Freedom to Vote Act. Please, I'm going to put our uh, Peace Progressive Caucus uh, link in the chat box. Join ProDA to join, volunteer, and donate. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Bruce. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Miguel from our Global Youth Caucus. Good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, you are in the world. My name is Jose Miguel Madrigal. I am the chair of the Global Youth Caucus of Democrats Abroad. So I have a question for all of you watching us right now. You are a young student in college. What is your number one uh, problem right now. It's probably the um, a massive amount that you have to pay in tuition and fees in your college right now. This is unacceptable. Thankfully, we have a Democratic president who is really engaged with the youth and has delivered a major campaign promise uh, for giving student loan debt. I, for example, I live in Costa Rica. Uh, today's, by the way, today is Independence Day, um, and I pay around four hundred dollars a year in terms of people what people pay in, in the United States. It is time for this to change, and thank and we I, we are very thankful we have a president who actually delivers. Now, some of you, I've heard some people not very happy with what's being done, but remember, progress is always. Uh, uh, 
Um, it doesn't come in a straight line. There's always a uh, space to grow. So yes, this is a first step for us uh, as, as students in our in getting a, a, a more affordable education. But you know, the, the, the load, road for progress is long and we will get there. So I hope you enjoy this event uh, Rebecca has prepared for us. And by the way, you can follow the, the Democrats Abroad Youth Caucus at Dems Abroad Youth on Instagram and look us up on Facebook as um, Youth Democrats Abroad Youth Caucus. So I toss it back to Rebecca. Thank you very much. And thank you for attending this amazing, amazing event and very well planned event. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Miguel. Um, can you go to the next slide? Uh, I'm going to now kind of give a very broad stroke view of what student loan relief is available. So uh, as Bruce already mentioned, uh, the relief that has been approved under the Biden-Harris administration to date includes uh, 13 billion to 1 million borrowers whose institutions took advantage of them through discharges related to borrower defense and school closures, 9.6 billion for 175,000 borrowers through the federal uh, through the public service loan forgiveness program, and 9 billion in total and permanent disability discharges for more than 425,000 borrowers. Um, in addition to that, a lot of you are probably already aware of the fact that payments have been on pause since March 2020. Now that payment pause has been extended until the end of this year and payments will resume from January, but I'm gonna mention here in a minute about what's, what's gonna happen starting next year. Um, so go ahead to the next slide. So what relief is available? If you meet the income requirements and have eligible loans, the amount of your debt relief will depend on your outstanding balance and whether you received a federal Pell Grant. So if you received a Pell Grant, you can receive up to $20,000 in debt relief. If you didn't receive a Pell Grant, you can receive up to $10,000 in debt relief. If your outstanding loan balance is less than the maximum amount of debt relief you're eligible for, you'll receive only relief of your full loan balance. And once you submit your application for debt relief, your loan provider will determine your relief amount. Um, so that's just kind of a, a broad stroke uh, um, eligibility. Um, how do you practically get the relief? It's actually a three-step process. The first thing that you should do is check if you're eligible. So this is your, your income. So we mentioned the $125,000. Um, the income level is based on your U.S. tax return. Now, I'm aware that there are a lot of people who have either not been filing a U.S. tax return um, or who have defaulted on their student loans. So they haven't been paying their student loan payments because you can't afford that. Um, Migle from My Expect Taxes is going to talk more about the practicalities of filing a U.S. tax return um, just after I finish. Um, but the thing that you need to keep in mind here is that the way that they're going to determine payments on an ongoing basis is going to be based on your income on your U.S. tax return in 2021 or 2020. So that is the first thing. Um, the second thing is you need to get ready by logging into your studentaid.gov account and make sure that your information is up to date. Um, if you don't have a studentaid.gov account, ev everybody here uh, can go and register for one and set up a brand new uh, account so that you can then manage your student loan information online. Uh, and then the third thing will be to submit your application to get the relief. The application is going to be made available online in early October 2022. You'll then have until the end of 2023, so the last day will be December 31st, 2023, to submit your application to receive the student loan relief. Uh, next slide. 
what loans are eligible? I saw a lot of questions about this in the Q&A. So this is the list of the federal student loans that are eligible. So that includes undergraduate and graduate direct loans, parent plus and grad plus loans, consolidated loans, federal family education loans, uh, Perkins loans, uh, and defaulted loans. So uh, people who had a loan taken out by their parent, the eligibility will be based off of your parents' income, not your income. Uh, and uh, anybody who has any of these federal student loans will be eligible for the relief. Uh, I'll, I'll just leave it there for a second, uh, just so that you can see, you can also take a screen grab, but you'll also get these slides so that you'll be reminded exactly which loans are eligible for the relief. Uh, so I will, okay, I'm gonna go to the next slide now. Um, so this is a big question is, is retroactive relief available? So the answer is yes. Uh, you will automatically receive a refund of your payments during the payment pause. So any of the payments that you received, uh, or sorry, any of the payments that you made um, from March 2020 to now uh, could potentially be eligible for a refund. Uh, in order to get the retroactive relief, you need to successfully apply for and receive the debt relief under the administration's debt relief plan. So when applications become available in October, you need to apply for it. The second part is, it, is that your voluntary payments during the payment pause brought your balance below the maximum debt relief amount that you're eligible to receive, but you did not pay off your loan in full. So unfortunately, I've heard from a number of people already, there were people that were able to pay off their loan during the payment pause. Unfortunately, those people are not eligible for retroactive relief. Um, you have to have an account in order for you to apply for the relief, and you also have to have some kind of a balance. So even if you have an account and there's only $1 left on your federal student loan, you are still eligible for that retroactive relief if you made any payments during the payment pause period. Um, so there's an example here. If you're a borrower eligible for $10,000 in relief and you had a balance of $10,500 prior to March 13, 2020, which was when the payment pause came in and you made $1,000 in payments uh, since then, and that would bring your balance to $9,500, um, they will discharge your $9,500 balance and then you'll receive a refund of $500. So that is how the retroactive relief will work. Uh, next slide. Uh, another question we've gotten is, is the relief available for private student loans? Um, the answer is basically no. But what you can do is you can contact your lender, uh, your private lender, to look into either refinancing options or loan payment assistant program options, and even forbearance if you're not able to afford the payments. Um, so there are options available in order to help you manage your private student loan debt. Uh, next slide. Uh, and am I eligible if I defaulted on my student loans? Absolutely. Even if you defaulted on your student loans a very long time ago and you haven't been paying any of your payments, um, if you have a balance, uh, um, you can uh, enter what is called the Fresh Start Initiative. This is a brand new initiative that was started by the Department of Education in April, and it's there to help eligible borrowers who are in default. Now, the program runs until the end of next year. In order to find out more information, um, if you're eligible and to enroll in it, you need to go to studentaid.gov slash fresh start. Um, on top of that, I know that there are a number of people who have defaulted and they just don't even know who their loan servicer is anymore. What you can do is you can contact the Department of Education's default resolution group and there's a link on the, uh, on the screen there. Uh, again, you're gonna get these slides later. So, 
I think the main thing what I really want to reiterate here is I've talked to a number of people over the years who have defaulted on their student loans and they thought that if they voted that they would get red flagged and they would be hunted down. Um, that is not how voting works. Um, defaulting on your student loans has nothing to do with exercising your right to vote. So 100% make sure that you vote this year um, because it has nothing to do with stu federal student loan debt. Okay, next slide. Um, I am now going to hand it over to Migle, who's going to explain how uh, you, when you file your US federal tax return, how that impacts on your payment amount uh, for paying off any outstanding um, uh, balance on your loan. So I'll hand it over to Migle now. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, thank you for having me and well, good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Could I have my slides, please? So my name is Migla. I'm the US Tax Senior at my Expat Taxes. And of course, today, as mentioned, I'll talk about student loans and expat taxation. Next slide, please. Um, so I won't make this a sales pitch, but anyways, I do think we have amazing software um, in terms of, um, I used to work in the traditional practice for six, seven years. So I really see the difference in the value for money that you get um, with our company. So you never get um, charged any additional fees and we have um, three different tiers. So you can file on the do it yourself professional. Um, if you have any questions and you need a little bit of help or you can file under the premium tier if you need a comprehensive tax support. So in terms of fees, I think we do try to help expats as much as possible. Also, um, in terms of the timing, um, provided you have all of your information ready and it does not need a professional tax review, you can e-file in as little as 15 minutes. If it does need to be reviewed by the tax professional, um, normally we get back to you within three to five working days. And in terms of accuracy, because it's a software, um, I do think um, we lessen the human errors and there's um, all the tax treaties from all the different countries are incorporated in our software, which is great. And whatever you enter, um, you don't miss out on any forms, even on the do-it-yourself um, tier. So yes, so if you're interested, please check us out now. The next slide, I'll move to the actual presentation. So I'm sure you've heard of, um, of the actual relief, um, how much you'll be getting. So 10,000 for non-Pell Grant recipients, 20,000 for Pell Grant recipients. Now, in terms of the income, it's, um, it's set at the threshold and it currently says income less than 125,000 for single or married filing, um, married filing separately and this doubles for married filing jointly. It has not yet been defined if it will be your adjusted gross income or your taxable income. But as Rebecca said, this will be based on your um, um, 2021 or 2020, sorry if um, if I said it wrong, um, tax return. So you need to make sure you file your current year tax return. If you've not done so, I'll explain it to you how you can do it. So, and the important point is that it will come directly from the Department of Education rather than the IRS. Due to American Rescue Plan between 2021 to 2025, this will not be classed as taxable income on your federal tax return. The states, they need to still confirm. I think there still are seven states who want to tax it, but it, it may be difficult for them to achieve, achieve it. So just keep an eye out on the states. Now, next slide, please. Now, in terms of the taxation, so let's say you are high income earner and you would like to take advantage of the student loan forgiveness relief. Um, there's um, foreign and income exclusion, uh, which is not a required tax form for the UX expats, but you can use it because it directly lowers your AGI. So it makes 
potentially will make you eligible for student loan forgiveness relief. And as the name suggests, um, you can exclude currently up to 108,000 of foreign source earned income from the US taxation and income, meaning um, your wages or your self-employment income. But please note, if you have children, um, this may not be the best option to take as it makes you ineligible for refundable child tax credit. Also, if you would like to contribute towards your IRA, again, this is not a benefit you want to take advantage of. To the next slide, please. Um, also, now in terms of um, the student loan repayments, um, this can be good for you if for, for one reason or another, you don't want to make the student loan payment um, as, um, as is driven by your income. So to use it on a, for, to use an example, let's say um, you don't have any other sources of income apart from foreign wages of 50,000, you can exclude the whole amount from by uh, for an anti income exclusion, which then will reduce your adjusted gross income. So you will not have to make the student loan repayments for the current year. But um, on the other hand, the interest will still continue to accrue on any unpaid amounts. Um, so just please be mindful of that. Now the next slide, please. Right, so if the foreign earned income exclusion is not for you, there's still option for the foreign tax credits. Um, and it's, it's great because you can take foreign income taxes paid on whether it's your earned income or whether it's your passive income, such as interest, um, dividends or capital gains. Um, and you avoid the double taxation. Of course, on your US tax return, you won't go into a refund position, but um, but anything that you do not use in terms of your foreign taxes, um, you can carry it forwards for the next 10 years. Now, also for those of you who have children and you would like to take advantage of the refundable child tax credits, if you are eligible, you could receive up to 1,400 per child per tax year. Also, you could contribute towards your um, all uh, right, and there's also a third option, which is um, using the foreign income exclusion together with the FTC. There's some some more things to consider, but uh, the most important point is that um, you need to expect a higher tax rate applied to your income if you use this option. So. Um, Please be mindful, foreign earned income exclusion is great benefit to have, um, but you need to look at your individual tax case and you need to work out um, which, op which option is better for you, whether it's foreign earned income exclusion or FTC option. And of course our software does that for you. Next slide, please. And um, now for those of you who've not filed before and you're panicking or you don't know where to start, um, the IRS offers streamlined foreign offshore procedure. So basically, if you're not filed, let's say 10 years, seven years, six years, all you need to do is file your uh, last three tax years. So at the moment, that would be 2018 to 2020. And you will need to also file FBARs um, for the last six years, even if um, let's say you only opened for an account last year, but we just would need to still file six years. So um, yes, so the benefit, um, yes, uh, would be that you would not be um, penalized uh, for filing late. So there would be no late fi filing penalties applied um, to your tax returns. And due to the foreign anti income exclusion or FTC, you are very un unlikely to own any taxes on your federal tax return. And actually, on your 2020 and 2021 um, US tax returns, you are more likely to be in a refund position due to the stimulus payments um, that were paid out. Now, the downside is that at the moment, the IRS does not accept um, e-filing for streamlined. So you will need to 
file um, the three years 2018 to 2020 by paper mail and the process it's it's always been quite long but at the moment it's it's really long it's around six six months time so um, as Rebecca said if you would like to make your student loan forgiveness application please e-file your current year tax return as soon as possible. You can also claim the third stimulus payment if you haven't filed already. And, uh, and yes, and then catch up on your previous tax um, years if you can. So that's it from me. Um, right, and yes, um, if you have any questions, please ask them at the end. Or yes, there's a Facebook group that you can join for my expert taxes. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Meekly. That was really helpful. Um, so I think at this point, if we go to the next slide, what we're going to do is I'm going to actually open it up for Q&A. Um, and I think it's the next slide. Did I do? There we go. Submit your questions now. There you go. <laughs> um, so go ahead and submit your questions and don't forget to look at other people's questions that they're submitting and make sure you upvote the ones that you want to hear about first because we might run out of time and we may not be able to answer everybody's questions. So just a reminder, you want to put it into the Q&A box, not the chat box. We are not going to answer any questions in the chat box. While you're all submitting all of your questions, I'm going to go ahead and, and make make my pitch about the taxation task force. So uh, Democrats Abroad advocates for a switch to residency-based taxation, uh, which would uh, remove the duplicative filing. So you would only have to file in the country that you live in, and also the double taxation that many Americans abroad, unfortunately, uh, experience. Uh, we also advocate for eliminating the FATCA reporting of foreign accounts uh, for Americans abroad uh, and an exemption for American business owners living abroad from the guilty and transition taxes. Uh, we do a lot of work on raising awareness with Congress about the vast number of problems and issues that Americans abroad experience with tax and financial access issues. So um, if you'd like to find out more information about our work, uh, you can go to uh, the Taxation Task Force's uh, part of the DA website there. Um, I think somebody will probably put it in the chat box there. But uh, yeah, go ahead. Next slide. Um, what uh, we do on an, what we've done recently is we're going to be releasing a report on the um, we did we did a survey of just under 7000 Americans abroad on the tax and financial access issues that they experience. So that report based on the survey results is gonna be coming out soon. Uh, if you'd like to hear more about it, you can sign up for the Taxation Task Force mailing list. Uh, so you can stay in the loop on all of the different advocacy work that we do on behalf of Americans abroad. Uh, we also host these tax and financial education events all over the world. Uh, this one in particular is very unique given that uh, we've had this one time write off of uh, student loan pay, uh, payments, uh, sorry, a student loan uh, amount. <laughs> Um, but we also host lots of other webinars because at the end of the day, what we found is that when people aren't educated, uh, they are very fearful of exercising their right to vote. And so we want to make sure that you are fully educated and are aware that taxes have nothing to do with voting. If you haven't been filing, that has nothing to do with your right to vote and everybody should vote. Same with if you've defaulted on your student loans, it has nothing to do with your right to vote vote and everybody should be exercising their right to vote. Um, so some of the other things that we do is we actually um, go and we visit Washington, D.C. So we did a visit in, in June this year where we actually talked to legislators. We talked to members of Congress about these issues to raise awareness and also to try to push legislation to change the law to make it fair for Americans abroad. Next slide. And five things that you can do to help. Uh, as I think we've already said many, many times, um, please, please, please register to vote. You can do that at votefromabroad.org. Um, another thing you can do is you can actually join Democrats Abroad as a member. It's totally free and you get kept in the loop on all the different kinds of great stuff that DA is doing. Uh, so go to democratsabroad.org to register. 
Um, the other thing you can do is donate. Um, we did ask for people to uh, consider a $10 donation. Uh, even though this webinar was free, we would really super appreciate your support if you can spare $10 or any amount that you can afford. Uh, this webinar is put on purely by volunteers. I'm a volunteer. Everybody else, um, except for our, our guest, um, is a volunteer here. And so we want to make sure that we can fund these webinars going forward. So please consider uh, making a $10 donation. Um, and then finally, to sign up uh, for our mailing list, actually, there is a link on our website. Um, and also, if you're interested in volunteering, uh, there's also a link there. So uh, lots of great information to stay in the loop. Uh, next slide. And I think that, uh, ah, OK, great. So that is uh, it. And we can now go to the Q&A. Actually, Brett, if you could go back to the Q&A slide, that would be really helpful, I think. Um, I'm going to go to the questions now. Um, <laughs> wow, we have uh, over 50 questions, and I'm not totally sure if we're going to be able to get through all of them. Um, the first question, it looks like I'll be able to take a number of these, but um, Migli, I'll, I'll go through them, and then if there's one that I can't answer, I'll, I'll toss it over to you. How does that sound? Sounds good. Okay, great. So the top one is, does it matter if it was a subsidized or unsubsidized loan, I'm assuming they mean a federal loan. So no, it does not matter. Um, if it is a federal loan, then it is eligible for the um, relief. Uh, next one is also if there are any advocacy going on to get public service loan forgiveness to apply to public service overseas jobs that do not have an EIN. Um, which ultimately kills me every day because I have 10 plus years working for a public institution abroad. Uh, yeah, I am aware of that. Um, I am not aware of any advocacy on that front, um, but I, uh, yes, I completely understand and feel you on that. Unfortunately, it does have to be a qualified institution in order to be eligible. Um, so the next one is, uh, I definitely qualify for a Pell Grant, but that was 30 years ago. I don't have an account with the Department of Education as far as I'm aware. How can I prove I was a Pell Grant recipient? Um, so if you don't have a Department of Education uh, uh, account, uh, you can go onto the website and you can register for one. If you don't know who uh, your loan servicer provider is, or if you're not able to set up an account, uh, what you can do is you can actually call um, uh, it one of the numbers. It, um, we're going to be sending multiple different follow-up links from the Department of Education's website. And so it will include a link for you to be able to contact them in order to find out more information for you to connect uh, with uh, following up on applying the debt relief to your uh, account. Um, but with grants, generally speaking, uh, grants are not something that you have to pay back. Um, so uh, the debt relief is only eligible for um, loans. So just to be clear on that. So hopefully that, that helps. Um, the next question is, there are also announced changes to interest rates going forward. Is that correct? Can someone explain those changes? Uh, you are correct um, that there are changes to interest rates. Um, however, I don't have detailed information on that at hand. Um, some of that is still being worked on, I think. The best way to find out about that is to actually call your student loan servicer and to find out what your new interest rate will be from January. My understanding is that they're going to get a lot more information in October when once they open up the um, the uh, the online uh, portal for you to be able to apply for the relief. So, um, but you can definitely call your student loan servicer now and and ask them because it will depend on your circumstances and your loan. Um, it was a long time ago. Where would I find out if I had a Pell Grant? Um, again, that's something that you can go on to um, the website, uh, the Department of Education website, and you can set up an account. And then you should be able to then 
I'm just trying to find the, uh, it's studentaid.gov. Uh, so if you go to studentaid.gov and then you set up an account, you will then be able to pull up information. Uh, next one, can you please clarify what you mentioned about it, depending on our parents' income, if they helped us take out the loan? I believe they helped me take out loans, but I am the one repaying them. Um, so, uh, and then somebody else commented saying, yes, please, part of my undergrad loans have a parent plus loan and I have a separate graduate plus loan. I'm repaying all of them. So it depends on whose name the loan is under. So if the loan is under your parents, then it the qualifying criteria will, will be based off of your parents' income. If the loan is under your name, then it will be based off of your income. So, I mean, in theory, like if your parent has a loan that they took out for you, and then you also have a loan that you took out for your education as well, in theory, each of you could individually um, uh, be eligible for the full amount of relief. So, um, yeah, that in theory, that could happen. So um, hopefully that helps clarify that. What if your federal student loan was sold to a private lender? Oh, um, gosh, I don't know, <laughs> I, to be honest. Um, that's a very good question. Um, I mean, most of the time it's not sold, but I would say that you should contact your loan provider, uh, whoever your private lender is. Um, I think sometimes people get private lenders mixed up with um, some of the loan uh, servicers that are actually managing it on behalf of the Department of Education. So potentially, even though you might be using like Sally May, or I, I noticed there were a few other ones, uh, Aliens, uh, Mines Under Mohila. So like, I know there's a lot of different loan servicers, um, but they are administering federal student loans. It's not like your loan has been converted into a private loan. So definitely do follow up with your loan um, provider to see what options are available. As long as it's a federal loan, it should be eligible. Um, so hopefully that that helps. Uh, my loans went from federal to Sally Mae as well, but when Googling Sally Mae, they're private, so curious if they considered private. Um, again, that's one of those things where you're gonna have to contact Sally Mae to double check to see if your loan is a federal loan or if it is a private loan. As long as it's categorized as a federal loan and it's being administered by Sally Mae, it should be eligible for the relief. Um, will you address dealing with FFE LP loans? I think I already talked about that earlier, um, but I'll, I'll leave that for now. Um, my loans were sold to Nelnet. Am I eligible? Um, again, you'll need to double check with your loan provider. Um, I know a lot of people's loans have been sold um, or moved around. Um, more often than not, your loan is being administered by, by a private company, but it's still a federal loan. The private company is administering that on behalf of the Department of Education. So you need to contact them to check to see if it's a federal loan or if it's a private loan. If it's a federal loan, it's eligible. If it's a private loan, it's not eligible. Um, so, okay, Migle, I think we have a question for you. <laughs> um, it says, so we e-file and then automatically get a check or direct deposit for 10K. I'm so confused. So I, I think it's what you said, how it works. It, it won't be coming from the IRS. So you, you won't be getting um, 10K from the IRS. The reason why you need to um, file your current year tax return is to deter determine your adjusted gross in the, the income threshold. This is what you need to determine. So that's why we say you need to file your tax return and you make the, um, the application for the student loan relief based on your current year or 2020 tax return, if I'm correct. Um, so, so yeah, it's just, it won't be coming from the IRS if that answers it at all. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, okay, so it says, do direct loans qualify for loan forgiveness? If so, how can I find out? 
I've been paying my loans for 17 years. Again, you need to contact your uh, student loan servicer, uh, whoever that is. Uh, and you can also log into your account as long as it is a federal loan. It should be, and also you meet the um, income criteria. Uh, that There it is, studentaid.gov. Um, you can log into studentaid.gov. Um, if you don't have an account, you can set up an account um, and then make sure that you're then ready and have your updated information available for when they open up applications for the relief. Um, what would qualify as a private loan? Banks, I am with Navient with my sub and unsubsidized loans. Is this considered a private loan? Thank you. Um, so you can contact your uh, loan provider to ask them to clarify for you if it is a, a private loan or uh, not a private loan. Um, the subsidized versus unsubsidized loans those tend to be federal loans, but I don't want to assume because I don't know your personal circumstances. So do contact your um, loan provider to double check to see if it's a federal loan. If it's a federal loan, then it's eligible for the relief. Uh, does the public service loan forgiveness program apply to people doing public service abroad, not related to the military, but volunteering and running a nonprofit? Um, unfortunately, my understanding is no. The uh, To be eligible for the public service loan forgiveness program, it needs to be an eligible company. So you would need to speak to the company that you work for um, to see if they do provide uh, or el are eligible for that program. Um, I have not personally met anybody who has worked for an institution overseas um, that has qualified. Um, but it's always worth asking. If you don't ask, you don't get. So you never know, you just gotta ask. Um, next question, if I understand correctly, there are also announced changes to interest rates going forward. Um, so I did uh, address this earlier. I don't know offhand about interest rate changes. Um, that's something that you will need to contact your loan provider about in order to ask if that's going to be applied going forward uh, or starting in January when payments resume. So um, do check with them. And at the same time, we're going to be sending out links from the uh, Department of Education website, which has a lot of really good information. They're updating it like every day, I've noticed. So you can go and check those out. And once information is released about the interest rate changes, I'm sure that will be made available. Um, I'm just conscious of time. Um, I'm going to do one more. Uh, how can we figure out if our loan is private or not? Uh, you can ask your loan provider and they should be able to tell you if it's a federal loan or if it's a private loan. Um, so I'm going to leave it there. I'm sorry we didn't get through all of the questions. Uh, but the final thing I would say is uh, just thank you everybody for coming. I hope you found this useful. Um, again, don't forget to vote. <laughs> Um, if you, uh, everybody's going to get a follow-up email with the recording and the slides and links and all the information. So, uh, that all of that will be emailed to you afterwards. So thank you again, everybody so much and, um, have a good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you very much.